Uh, welcome everybody. Sorry about the art noise terror at the beginning. It's um, actually it's a Jesus and Mary chain concert. I hope you know that. Um, you're also young. You don't even find that funny. Uh, welcome to our journalism after Snowden lecture, entitled "Source Protection: Rescuing a Privilege Under Attack." Uh, thank you very much indeed for turning out to support the journalism after Snowden um, program. Uh, and I'm really pleased that we've been able to fill the brand new Brown Institute for Media Innovation and the Tau Center, uh, of which I'm the director, um, is housed within here. Uh, and I hope that those of you from outside the journalism school that enjoyed the space and those of you from within the journalism school come back here often to our events. I'm Emily Bell, the director of the Tau Center. Uh, and the tonight's lecture is actually the first in a series of four uh, that we're doing in collaboration with um, the Graduate School of Journalism here and the Information Society Project at Yale Law School. Um, Jen Henriksen, where are you, Jen? Jen's actually outside, I think, uh, signing people in. But Jen is the, has been um, pulling together and coordinating our Journalism After Snowden project. And at the end of tonight's lecture, she will uh, give you the heads up on the things that are coming next in this program. Um, tonight's lecture is actually particularly timely following the recent court ruling rejecting any privilege for New York Times reporter James Risen. Uh, to protect his confidential sources. Uh, the topic's relevant to anyone who's concerned about the state of investigative journalism in America, or indeed, as I know from you know, a UK news organization, even beyond that. Tonight's lecture is entitled Source Protection, Rescuing a Privilege Under Attack, and it's going to review the state of the reporter's privilege and reflect upon whether the Obama administration really is, as everybody says, worse than Nixon. Um, and we really couldn't have a better person uh, to, do, to, to deliver the lecture. This is uh, David Schultz. Um, he's an esteemed lawyer. Uh, <coughs> he heads New York, uh, the New York office of Levin, Sullivan, Koch, and Schultz. He's got extensive experience of issues surrounding the protection of sources and reporters' privilege. He was lead counsel for the New York Times on WikiLeaks and lead counsel for The Guardian on the recent NSA leaks, and I think still continues to work with first look on the, uh, on, on the NSA leak. So he really is uh, right in the center of things. We like to keep him busy uh, with our naughty journalism. Um, as well as that, um, he also works, uh, or has been working with the Associated Press in its battle with the Department of Justice over the seizure of AP phone records. Um, among, the, among other significant access matters, He's argued that precedent-setting cases establishing the constitutional right of access to jury selection procedures, pre-trial motions, and court dockets, and prevailed in, comp in compelling the release of information about de detainees at Guantanamo Bay and the military service records of President George W. Bush, which I know we're all very interested in. Uh, David is also the Floyd Abrams visiting clinical lecturer in law at the Yale Law School. Uh, and he serves as co-director of the Media, Media Freedom, Freedom and Information Access Clinic. I do wish I'd have slightly shorter titles. Uh, and also he can be found over the way, uh, lecturing from time to time at Columbia as well. So he is indeed right. one of our own. So after that lengthy intro, um, David's going to deliver the lecture, uh, after which there'll be chance for Q&A and then drinks at the end. So please join me in welcoming David Schultz. Okay, well, thank, <laughs> thank you, Emily, and um, it's great to be here. It's sort of um, intimidating to be giving the first lecture in a series on post-Snowden journalism, you know, particularly as a lawyer, because it sounds like what the real focus here is, what's been the impact of Snowden on journalism? Um, but I think it is a, an appropriate topic um, for the first discussion because um, reporter source communications are uh, an important topic. Uh, and one that is largely driven by the law. Um, and so what I'm gonna try to do during the lecture today is, uh, is three main things. And maybe before I start, let me just ask, um, how many of you here are journalism students or journalists as opposed to lawyers, okay? Any lawyers here? Oh, good. So if I get it wrong, you won't know. Um, you know, the good news and the bad news is I, I, I have taught law for many years. I've taught at the Columbia Law School here for the past seven or eight years. Um, and so the good news is, is that I know the law. You know, the bad news is that I know the law. So this may be a little more legal than some of the lectures or some of the talks 
uh, you're going to have in this series. Um, but it's also, you know, I'm also glad to be here because of the whole, the, the post Snowden thing. You know, shortly after uh, The Guardian uh, won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service and Reporting last spring, Alan Rusberger, the um, editor of The Guardian, spoke to the graduating class here. Uh, and one of the things that he said, one of the lessons he drew from Snowden and the disclosures was, and I quote him here, all forms of power will always need scrutiny. The world, therefore, will always need reporters. Um, and he went on to say, standing up to powerful institutions will always require resource and resolve. And I think those really are some of the lessons of Snowden. And um, it's one of the key things I think we need to think about when we talk about the reporter's privilege, which is what we're going to focus on tonight. Where are we with the reporter's privilege? Um, having represented the AP for a long time uh, and having been very involved uh, a year ago, some of you may remember that uh, the Department of Justice seized a massive amount of AP phone records secretly and told them months after the fact. Around the same time, it also came out that they had gotten a search warrant for the uh, emails of a Fox reporter, uh, both in connection with different leaks investigations. Um, so it's a very, very timely subject. And of course, as Emily mentioned, probably the most critical thing that's happened in this area recently was the decision by the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, a court that sits in Richmond uh, last year, uh, that denied um, any reporter's privilege to James, James Risen. And that's really kind of the, uh, where we are today and maybe is the place to start with, because in that case, um, uh, Jim Risen, a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter for the New York Times, refused to disclose his source in connection with a trial of an of a individual who's being accused of having leaked classified information. Uh, Risen was able successfully to assert a privilege in the district court, uh, but it was reversed in the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court first refused to reverse the decision. And you know, the bad news about the Risen decision in the Fourth Circuit is not just that it, it denied the privilege on the facts of that case, um, but the Fourth Circuit in that case said there is no reporter's privilege under the First Amendment, there is no reporter's privilege under the common law, and in fact said, we don't even think there's any constitutional concern here that we need to balance or worry about when a reporter is called to testify in court. And that's really kind of a stunning thing when you think about what, what Alan Rusberger was here saying about the need for good reporters and the way that good reporters get their information. Um, it's sort of interesting to me. You would think that by now, um, the role of confidential sources and the need for reporters to be able to make a promise of confidentiality to a source, a promise that they can stand behind and would be recognized by a court, would be fundamental. You know, that it's, it's a sort of a, uh, the way that human nature works. There is a lot of information that would not get to the public, would not be included in news reports, if reporters couldn't um, offer their sources a pledge of confidentiality. And it's surprising that we get to the point where the Fourth Circuit says uh, no, such no such right of a reporter exists, that if the court wants to know what happened, the court can do it. Um, you know, the, the rationale, the, the, the need for a reporter's privilege can be measured in many ways. You know, one is the number of front page stories that you read every day that um, rely upon unnamed or confidential sources. And several years ago when, when this was a was once before, you know, there's sort of these cycles. It's kind of like Groundhog's Day if you're in this area of the law, like constantly refighting this battle. But um, several years ago, it was a big issue. And, and someone actually did a statistical study where they took the front page news stories from, I think it was eight or 10, I don't care if you remember these, but uh, newspapers around the country for a period of time. And they, they just looked at each one to see what percentage of those stories on, you know, daily routine stories relied on confidential sources or had unnamed sources. And it was sort of staggering. I can't remember the numbers, 35 or 40 percent, just on a routine basis. But the types of information, you know, the, the exposés of what goes on in a nursing home or uh, any number of stories that you've read, all apart from national security reporting, rely on confidential sources. And so how do we get to the point where a court says uh, it doesn't matter? Um, you know, the rationale that <clears throat> is looking through some of these things historically, back in 1941, uh, then Attorney General Robert Jackson, um, how many of you know that name, just out of curiosity, any history majors? He went on to be the, um, one of the prosecutors at the Nuremberg Trials and was appointed to the Supreme Court. 
Well, he was Attorney General back in 1941, which is what, uh, 60, 70 years ago, I told my math quickly here. But he, he, he had, um, uh, had to defend or to, to fight a subpoena that was issued by Congress to the FBI for certain information that they felt they were entitled to see. And he refused to give the information. And what he said at the time, and I'm quoting him here, disclosures of the reports would be of serious prejudice to the future usefulness of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Much of this information is given in confidence and can only be obtained upon a pledge not to disclose its sources. And he went on to say later, we regard the keeping of faith with confidential informants as an indispensable condition to future efficiency. In other words, he was basically telling Congress, you're not going to get this because if I have to give this to you, the FBI can't do its job. And the dilemma we have in talking about the reporter's privilege is the courts don't understand that same principle when we're talking about reporters. Um, and what I want to explore as we go through this now is kind of three things. First, I'm going to walk through with you kind of a brief history of the reporter's privilege as it exists in law. Like, what is it that we talk about and how did we end up with this, this kind of unsettling Fourth Circuit decision? Uh, so we'll go through the history. We're going to look very briefly at some of the current cases and issues that are here. And then finally, we're going to try to see if there isn't a way forward. Like, like what is our best option for all of you as future journalists? How are, how are you going to develop and, and come up with a strategy that will get courts to understand the importance of this privilege and to recognize it as a matter of law. And let me just say as we go along, um, it's probably better if you want to hold your questions till the end, it might make it a little easier. Um, but if you have a burning question or if I'm not making sense, raise your hand and, and we can, can deal with them as we go along. Um, and I guess I also uh, would be remiss, we'll try at the end to say a word or two about technology uh, and whether uh, what role technology is going to play in a solution to this problem, because it's not just the law, but it's the technology that may be part of the way out. Um, and if there's time, we can talk a little bit about who is a journalist. You know, one of, one of the biggest problems people raise today about, about the journalist's privilege is, well, who gets, to get, who gets to claim it? Aren't we all journalists today with the internet? So if there's time, we'll, we'll look at those. But I want to focus on the privilege and, and what, it, what it is and, and um, how the law treats it. So the, the, the root of all of our current problems or the, the current development of the law in this country dates back to a decision in 1972 called Brandsburg versus Hayes that some of you, you may know or you may know the name. It's the only time, the only case that the United States Supreme Court has ever taken uh, to address the issue of whether the uh, Constitution, the First Amendment, conveys within it some sort of a protection for a reporter to preserve the confidential sources. Um, and to understand Brandsburg versus Hayes, we have to understand a little bit about the times in which it was, was litigated. It came up in 1972. Uh, it was uh, the era that was, I guess, post-Vietnam. Uh, 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 but it was pre-Watergate. It was an election year. Um, it was an era when President Nixon had uh, his, his war on the press. He had his enemies list. He was using um, federal prosecutors to subpoena people and to punish people, at least that were the allegations at the time. Uh, and in this context, um, the Supreme Court takes three cases uh, where reporters had asserted the reporter's privilege in similar factual settings and put them together and cited them uh, as Brandsburg versus Hayes. Uh, the cases were all similar because in each case, uh, the reporters had confidential sources that had led to news stories that had led to criminal investigations. Um, a couple of them uh, were uh, out of the Cincinnati area. Uh, one was a report on a hashish laboratory that was operating outside of Cincinnati where the reporter was allowed in and, and reported, you know, big deal at the time, how could we have people making illegal drugs in the, you know, the middle of the Midwest. Another was um, about uh, the um, growing of marijuana in Frankfort, Kentucky, again with confidential sources. And then there were a couple of cases that dealt, uh, of the stories that dealt with um, the Black Panthers, which were a big controversy at the time. A lot of uh, uh, concern about them, a lot of pers per police surveillance of them. And one of the stories um, dealt with a reporter who was given access to a Black Panthers office or headquarters uh, on a condition that uh, he wouldn't tell anybody what he saw or what happened. Uh, but he was invited in because the Black Panthers anticipated a police raid that night and they wanted a reporter there to see what happened so that they would have someone to give their side of the story. 
So in all of these cases, the reporters were subsequently called by the prosecutors to testify in front of a grand jury about what they heard. And in each of the cases, the reporters refused to go. And they basically said that under the First Amendment, the protection of a free press, uh, we think that we have the right not even to go into the grand jury, um, because if we do that, the, um, the people who rely on us, our confidential sources, will lose confidence, and we won't be able to get the type of information and the type of stories that the public have a need to know. Um, so that goes up to the Supreme Court. And one of the lasting problems of the case is that the decision was anything but clear. Um, it was a very divided court. You know, does that sound familiar? You think things are the same today? Um, uh, but it essentially was a 4-1-4 decision, and there were a lot of them at the time. Um, the four conservative justices led by Justice White um, rejected the, the privilege. They said that, um, that, that there was no privilege in this context. In fact, they said there was no privilege at all. Um, and and in, the, in the course of writing that opinion, Justice White said a number of things. He said, look, at, we're not saying that reporters are not free to do whatever they want when they're gathering the news. They can talk to people. They can you know, go about their business. But we, what we are saying is that reporters are not exempt from the obligations that every citizen has to appear in front of a grand jury. And so he framed the issue of as being one of, do reporters have special rights? And this, of course, was a red flag. There were a whole series of cases uh, decided in the 1970s, uh, including Brandsburg and a number of cases about access to prisons and access to courts. And you always knew that if the court framed the question of, do reporters have special rights, the answer was always going to be no. That, that there was um, a strong view that whatever the First Amendment meant, it didn't mean that reporters got special rights, that the rights in the First Amendment are available to everyone. Um, but more than just saying that, it, that, that we're not going to recognize special rights for the reporter, his decision goes on to say, essentially, we don't see the need for this privilege. The common law has never recognized a privilege in the, in the federal courts. Um, you know, the reporters have been working here for you know, 180 years or whatever it was by that point, 200 years. Um, and we don't think that reporters have made the case that, that the flow of information to the public will be diminished if we don't recognize this privilege. Um, so he, just, he really just didn't get it. Um, and, he, and he went on to say, in any event, the, the claims of the reporters doesn't adequately uh, take into account the, the public's overwhelming interest in effective law enforcement, which was a big deal at the time. You know, there were riots, there were things going down, people were concerned, Nixon ran on law and order. So he basically says, I don't think there's a need for this, I don't think you have special privileges, and the legitimate needs of law enforcement would override anything that you have to say in any event. The dissent, which was also for justices, was written by um, Justice Stewart uh, at the time, who was one of the biggest advocates and, and had several kind of public debates with Chief Justice Berger at the time about what the First Amendment meant and whether the press clause did in fact create institutional rights for an uh, institutional press. Um, he was a strong believer in, a, in, a, in the independent meaning of the press clause. Um, but he had four votes with him and said, you know, the need for this privilege stems from the broad interest of society in the flow of information to the public. And he really laid it out as a matter of logic. He said, you know, when, when we recognize other rights under the First Amendment, the right to travel, the right to do other things that are implicit in the Constitution, we don't require mathematical proof of the value to society. It follows as a matter of logic. And what he said essentially was what Attorney General um, uh, Jackson said back in the 1940s uh, with respect to reporters. He said, the logic is reporters require information if they're going to do their jobs. Confidentiality is essential for certain types of information to be made available to the reporters. And the subpoena power, if not um, checked by some sort of constitutional restraint, is going to stem the flow of that information. So he would have upheld the claim that the Constitution recognizes some uh, type of privilege, not an absolute privilege that you can never be required to, to testify about what you learn or in confidence, but a qualified privilege that would require a judge to make a balance of whether the information was really needed, whether it was available from other sources, uh, and so on, uh, before a, subpoena, a reporter could be subpoenaed into a grand jury. That didn't carry the day. The swing vote, who decided whether the, in these three cases the reporters would be required to testify or not, was Justice Powell, 
and his decision is rather enigmatic and, uh, and has led to a lot of confusion. What he essentially said is, you know, he, he first he, he voted with the majority, right? He voted with Justice White. So he said, on the facts here, I don't think that the reporters can avoid going in front of the grand jury, okay? But he went out of his way to say that we're not holding that newsmen subpoenaed to testify before a grand jury are without rights with respect to the gathering of the news, okay? So he's saying there's something here, there's some kind of right here. He went on to say, if the newsman is called upon to give information bearing only a remote and tenuous relationship to the subject of the investigation, or if he has some other reason to believe that his testimony implicates a confidential source relationship without any legitimate need of law enforcement, he will have access to the court on a motion to quash. Well, that sounds like he's saying, you know, there is some constitutional concern here and a judge should be involved in deciding it. But yet he voted with the majority, which said there is no right. So there was a lot of confusion after the fact, right? Um, and a lot of hand-wringing by media lawyers at the time that this was a, a terrible setback until um, Jim Goodale, who was the uh, general counsel at the time of the New York Times, uh, had, had actually spearheaded the, the litigation in Brandsburg because the Times, one of the Times reporters was one of the three whose cases was in front of the court. He also handled the Pentagon Papers case and a number of other things. He rallied the media lawyers around the country, said, you know, look at, we may have lost this case, but look at this, look at this opinion by Justice Powell. The only way to read that is that he recognizes some First Amendment interests here, and if you combine that with the four votes who, who would have, were in the dissent, <clears throat> and would have clearly found a privilege, we have a majority on the court that says at a minimum there's some sort of qualified privilege. And over the next 10 or 20 years, those arguments were made and largely successful in the lower courts. Um, courts around the country came to accept the notion that there is some level of constitutional protection, uh, at least in areas other than a grand jury subpoena. And many would, would distinguish Brandsburg by saying, there's a unique need for law enforcement information at the grand jury stage. But in civil courts, in criminal trials, and in other contexts, um, there was large acceptance of this notion that there is some constitutional privilege. Um, so hold that thought. And I just want to, because we're going to then go like, where did we go wrong along the way? Because it's things were going the right way. One other thing I just want to, to talk about in terms of what was happening back in the 70s that kind of are the groundwork for where we are today is there was a lot of uproar, particularly in the 1972 election, about the way the administration was targeting the press. You probably are all too young to remember Spiro Agnew and his nattering nabobs of negativism and the effete intellectual snobs on the East Coast. And they really went full bore against the, the, the New York or East Coast media establishment. Um, and as it has been called, you know, Nixon's war on the press, there were a lot of subpoenas and other things done. There was a lot of upset uh, that there was an abuse of power going on. <clears throat> and so one of the things that happened, one of the very good things that came out of that, is in an effort to quell some of the uproar, the Attorney General at the time, who was um, Attorney General Ed Meese, um, no great friend of the press, proposed guidelines that would limit when federal prosecutors could issue reporters uh, subpoenas to reporters. It was a, a way of kind of stopping this backlash. Now his, his guidelines that he proposed did not become law before he, uh, did, did not get adopted officially within the Department of Justice before he left. But later when Elliot Richardson came in to replace him, um, they were finally fully implemented and they were very important guidelines. What the guidelines said, these are internal Department of Justice guidelines that said to, to all prosecutors around the country, federal prosecutors, if you want to get information from a reporter, you're going to have to do three things, essentially. One is you're going to have to demonstrate that the uh, information the reporter has is critical to the investigation that you're doing that it essentially, you need that information because a prosecution is going to rise or fall on the testimony you can get from a, a reporter. Second, you're gonna to have to show that that critical information is not available from anyone who's not a reporter, right? Because we should leave the reporters alone. The, the, the guidelines had very flowery language about not operating the Department of Justice in a manner that would interfere with news gathering. And the third thing, third thing it said is if, if you can meet those two hurdles, you need to, to draft a subpoena 
that is as narrow as possible in terms of the information you need from the reporter. So this was very, very strong. It essentially was the standard that, that Justice Stewart was advocating for in the dissent in Brandsburg, and it was adopted as a rule within the Justice Department. But probably the, the final um, uh, most important aspect of it was that it says, and you, you have to make those three showings, that it's critical, that it's not available elsewhere, and that it's narrow to the Attorney General. In other words, it said, no one within the Department of Justice, anywhere in the country, can issue a subpoena to a reporter unless the Attorney General personally signs off on it. It was not delegated to a Deputy Attorney General or anyone else. And you can imagine if you're a, a, a prosecutor, a line prosecutor working in New York or Wichita, or, the idea that you've got to go to Washington uh, with something that you want to do, uh, you're just not going to do it very often. And so as a practical matter, for the next 30 or 40 years, the Attorney General guidelines were probably the single most important legal restriction uh, protecting reporters, uh, at least in the federal uh, judicial system. So there. So where, where do things uh, start to go wrong? That's, that's our brief history part. Let me see I'm doing on time. Okay. So where do things start to go wrong? And I think that, that um, we could, at least I would peg the, the, the beginning of the decline in, in the, the reporter's privilege protection to a case back in 2003, post 9-11, um, but having nothing to do with national security reporting, a case called McKevitt versus Palish. Um, this is a, a decision out of Chicago in a, in a not very significant case. In fact, it didn't even involve um, a U.S. criminal prosecution. It was a case where an individual was being prosecuted in Northern Ireland for having aided the IRA, and uh, he wanted to get uh, tape recordings that had been made by a journalist in Chicago who was writing a book on the IRA. Uh, and so he went through the international procedures, which are allowed, and got a subpoena issued out of the courts in Chicago to the journalist to get these tape recordings. Um, and the journalist moved to Quash, making the arguments that, that uh, a privilege attaches, that you have a burden to meet, you've got to show that you can't get it from other sources, and all the things we've just talked about. Um, and Judge Posner uh, was on the panel that got this case, and he said no. And if those of you who don't know who Judge Posner is, he's a very prolific um, uh, judge, very well respected. He's probably the most... Um, uh, noted and respected judge uh, in the United States who's not currently on the Supreme Court, and he's getting older now, so we'll probably never get there. But he's very influential, particularly among other judges. And he went out of his way in this case to um, correct what he thought was a terrible misreading of Brandsburg that had crept into the law over the last 30 years, right? And he basically said uh, to his fellow judges, you know, I don't know what you uh, have been reading, but I've read Bansberg, and it said there is no privilege. And so all of this case law that's out there that says, well, you put these things together and there really is a privilege, um, I don't get it. You know, he said, a large number of cases conclude rather surprisingly in light of Bansberg that there is a, is a reporter's privilege. And he went on to say essentially that uh, if you accept the notion that there's a privilege, you are, in his words, skating on thin ice. Well, it wasn't just that the privilege was denied in that case on the odd facts you know, of an international subpoena, but it was this blast from a very respected jurist that sort of said, you know, you better get this right because you guys are all misreading Brandsburg. And it led to a lot of rethinking among other federal courts. A lot of judges um, took notice and began to rethink this and began to reject motions to quash subpoenas. Um, but the other two cases I want to highlight, and again, I know this is probably more law than any of you expected or want tonight, but to me it's fascinating, and since I get to talk, you get, you're going to have to listen. But the other two cases you should know about, um, uh, I like to call the Judy Miller jurisprudence, um, because they both involve Judy Miller in very different contexts. Um, both of them involve the same prosecutor who was trying to get information about Judy Miller's sources, uh, the U.S. attorney in Chicago named Patrick Fitzgerald. So he would probably prefer that we call this the Fitzgerald jurisprudence. But either way, there are, there are, there are two very important cases in this post-McKevitt world when the courts are rethinking the scope of the privilege. The first Judy Miller case is a decision in the um, Court of Appeals in Washington uh, that came out of the Valerie Plame investigation. Everybody knows about that, right? Because you've all seen the movie Fair Game, right? With 
with uh, Naomi Watts and Sean Penn, right? Anybody not see that? You should go get it. You would love it if you're a journalist. But it was the whole investigation of, of who leaked the fact that um, Valerie Plame was a secret uh, covert CIA agent, um, a fact that apparently was leaked in retaliation for um, a, a, an op-ed column that her husband wrote in the New York Times. Her husband was an ambassador uh, named um, Joe Wilson. And in the whole um, lead up to the Iraq war, he wrote an op-ed piece that basically challenged some statements the president had made in his State of the Union address, claiming that they had confirmed um, a flow of yellow powder, which is used to make uranium or nuclear bombs, uh, from an African country to um, Iraq. And he wrote an op-ed piece saying, wait a minute, I was asked to check out those rumors, and they're, they're not true. And our intelligence community knows that they're baseless, and essentially uh, called the president for misleading the public in his State of the Union address, which led to a lot of um, uproar, as you can imagine. And then this fact comes out that his wife was a CIA agent. I've never quite understood why that was relevant or what they thought it was going to do if they, uh, you know, but, but it came out. And it led to a criminal investigation because one thing that the government takes very seriously is the protection of the identity of covert sources um, because it can lead to death and, and to all sorts of other reprisals. Um, so there was a very serious criminal investigation launched and Patrick Fitzgerald was given the task of figuring out how this information came out. He did all the things you're required to do under the Attorney General guidelines before he went to the reporters. He interviewed a lot of people who, who knew the information and who might have given it out. He, he got, um, I think in the White House, uh, everybody who worked at the White House was asked to, to sign a waiver saying that they waived any confidentiality they had with the press so that he was free to go talk to the reporters. The reporters wouldn't talk to him uh, notwithstanding those waivers. And anyway, push came to shove. He subpoenas um, Judy Miller, he subpoenas Matt Cooper at Time Magazine, two of the reporters who had the story first, and they oppose it and they fight it. And the end of the line is Judy Miller goes to jail for 85 days um, for refusing to turn over her sources. But what happens in the courts? When, when, the, when the argument goes to the um, DC uh, Court of Appeals on whether or not Judy Miller has the right to assert a privilege, right? And think about it. This is really in the same context as Brandsburg. It is a grand jury subpoena. Someone is investigating to see whether a law has been broken. And so it was pretty clear that the court was not going to accept an argument that there was a constitutional privilege that at stake here, that that, that issue could only be resolved if the Supreme Court took it because Brandsburg was pretty clear, at least on this point, that there's no First Amendment privilege in this context. So a major effort was made to argue, nonetheless, that there should be a common law privilege. And part of that was driven by the, um, the notes. You know, one of the things, is, I, I mentioned that the, the opinion of Justice Powell in Brandsburg is kind of confusing about what he meant. He rejects the constitutional privilege, but then raises all these things. After he died, his notes from the conference, you know, when the judges, after a week of hearing, they sit in a conference and they all talk around the table about how they're voting on each case and they just divide up the opinions. His notes from the conference on Brandsburg, he had scribbled some notes, um, and they actually were much more clear than his opinion. What his notes said, he said two things in, in his handwriting. We should not establish a constitutional privilege, okay? So we understood that. That was clear from his, his concurrence. Um, and then he went on to say, difficult to foresee who are newsmen, how to define question mark. So you can see he's thinking this is a bad idea to make this constitutional, it's going to create a lot of other problems. But then what he went on in this note was to say, there is a privilege analogous to an evidentiary one, which courts should recognize and apply to protect confidential information. So that really kind of clarifies what his thinking was, and it's just too bad he wasn't that clear in his opinion. But I think deciphering that uh, from a lawyer's standpoint is what he's saying is, I don't think we should constitutionalize this issue and say that the First Amendment creates some kind of special right for a news person that we don't know how they're going to be defined. But we should recognize an evidentiary privilege, in other words, a common law privilege. The courts should say there are interests here that need to be balanced. The same way we have an attorney-client privilege, that's not a constitutional privilege. We have a husband-wife privilege. We have a, 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 a psychologist, psychiatrist, patient privilege. And so he, clearly what Justice Powell anticipated is that that would be the way the law should go. 
And in this Miller case, Judy Miller case, um, that was the, the key argument that was made to the court, that all the same, all the reasons that you should recognize a privilege uh, under the First Amendment, you should recognize them under a common law privilege, right? And the court, the, the D.C. Circuit, did a rather unusual thing. I mean, they were very split. You know, these are three judge courts. One judge, the most conservative, Judge Sentel, uh, said there is no common law privilege because the Supreme Court also decided that in Brandsburg. And he reads the language where Justice White is saying, you know, we've never recognized this at the common law as a holding that there was no common law privilege. So he said, we can't change that. You have to go to the Supreme Court before we can change that. And he would have denied it on those grounds. Another judge, Judge Henderson, um, said, well, I don't know as a factual matter if I'm prepared to recognize a common law privilege, but if I were going to recognize a common law privilege, on the facts that are in front of me on the record of this case, I would say it was overcome. So I'm not going to decide today whether there is a privilege, but I am going to say that it can't be invoked here. And so she was trying to leave the issue open. Does that make sense? It's really convoluted. Judge Tatel, another highly respected jurist on the D.C. Circuit, um, took the opposite approach from Judge Henderson. He said, well, I think, I agree with Judge Henderson that the common law privilege is met here, or is overcome here, that, that the prosecutor has made enough of a showing that he's exhausted sources and et cetera. Um, but I think that before we can decide that he's met the burden, we have to decide whether there's a privilege or not. So he affirmatively holds that there is a privilege, right? So you have one judge saying no privilege, one judge saying a privilege, and one judge saying I'm not going to tell you right now. But the other thing that comes out of that case, the reason it has, has longer lasting importance, is that Judge Tatel went on to explain how he would apply the privilege, what the scope of a common law privilege would look like. And what he said is, you know, the, the, all of the arguments that have been made in the last 30 years by courts that have accepted a, a constitutional privilege in, in many contexts, the idea that we're going to look at whether it's critical, whether the information is critical to the investigation, and whether it's available from other sources, those are always met in a leaked investigation. It just becomes tautological. If you have a leak, and if the crime is the leak, which it was in this case, the, the allegation was somebody disclosed the name of Valerie Plame as a covert agent, that's a crime. Well, the only people who know who did that are going to be the source and the reporter, so there's not alternative sources for the prosecutor to run down. And it's essential to the crime, because the crime is the leak. So what Judge Tatel said is in those circumstances, we need to do something more. The common law requires something more, because there needs to be a role for a judge here, right? And we have to balance these constitutional interests. So he, he came up with what's now known as Tatel balancing, that says in the common law context, that when a prosecutor wants, uh, or someone wants in, uh, information in connection with a leak's investigation, uh, the court must make an assessment of how important is the crime or the wrongdoing that they're trying to unearth versus how important was it for the public to have the information that was leaked, right? So there's this balance that you do as a judge. And what he said in the, in the, in the Plame case is, I find that that balance has been met by the prosecutor here because he says the public has a very important interest in protecting the identity of covert agents. This is not a you know, private dispute or a victimless crime. It's a really important thing. And there was a whole history of, of uh, attacks on CIA agents in the 60s and during the Vietnam War. So he said that's a very important interest to get to the bottom of this. Um, and it outweighs any interest the reporter has in protecting uh, the criminal who released the information here. So he's, he said on this grounds, I would find the common law interest to overcome. Just to give you a sense of how the title balancing would work the other way, uh, a few years later, a case reached uh, the court and Judge uh, Tatel was on the, the panel uh, involving the case of Wen Ho Lee. Is that a name any of you know? Yeah, I feel like I'm getting so old. These are, Wen Ho Lee was a scientist at Los Alamos who, um, uh, during the Clinton administration, it was leaked that he was under investigation for um, uh, sending computer files or giving computer files to the Chinese government. And there was significant concern and it became a very partisan issue in the election in 1996 um, about whether the Clinton administration was forcefully, you know, protecting our secrets and it be, you can imagine how it gets demagogued. But it was this big cause celeb and when the prosecutors got done investigating it, they decided essentially they had the wrong guy, that there was no evidence that 
they had barked up the wrong tree, that, that Wen Ho Lee was innocent, um, and they dismissed all the charges. Um, and Wen Ho Lee then turned around and sued the government for a privacy violation, and without getting into all the details, it's, it essentially becomes a private leaks investigation, because what he said is, it was against the law for you to leak the fact that this investigation was happening, and my reputation was destroyed by this confidential information that got out. So he's trying to get from the reporters where they got the names, uh, who, who gave them the name and who released the fact that this investigation was ongoing, because he has a civil claim for money damages if he can prove that the, whatever agency gave out this name. So when that gets to Judge Tatel, he does his balancing again, right? It's like a leaks investigation. The only person that's going to know is the reporter, and the crime is the leak. Um, but he says, you know, in this case, the news value, the information that got out to the press was a potential disclosure of our nuclear secrets to a foreign government. That's a big story. That story deserved to get out. And on the other side of the balance, we have the claim of an individual for money damages, which if he doesn't get them, that may be unfortunate, but it's not the end of the world. So doing the title balancing, he, he said, in this case, I would uphold a claim of privilege and not require the reporters to, to give the case. Now, he was in a minority, but that's just to show you how the balance works. So that's one of the cases. Boy, now I've got to start talking fast. Um, the other Miller case, um, uh, I'm sure you never heard of her, but yes, you did. It, it was another case involving Judy Miller and a leak and Patrick Fitzgerald. This was a case involving investigation uh, into a leak. Uh, there was a, uh, after 9-11, there was a number of uh, investigations of Islamic charities in this country to see if they were funneling money to, to terrorists. And in connection with that, there was a, an organization in Chicago, the Global Relief Fund, uh, that was put on a watch list by the Department of Treasury, secret put on a watch list, and uh, the U.S. attorneys in Chicago got uh, search warrants to go to their offices in the suburbs of Chicago and um, pull their files to see you know, what they could find out if there had been some wrongdoing there. Well, somehow, between the time the search warrants were issued and the time the FBI agents showed up at the Global Relief Fund offices, some reporter called the Global Relief Fund and said, I understand the FBI is searching your files. Do you want to comment? So when the FBI shows up, they're there throwing away files and doing all sorts of things, and so that leads to a leaks investigation with Patrick Fitzgerald again. He goes through the whole process. This time, instead of subpoenaing the reporter, um, he subpoenas her telephone records, okay? A, a familiar tactic now these days. But, and what's interesting about this case is the New York Times, um, uh, when the subpoena, they get notice of the subpoena, uh, and they go to federal court here and ask the court to quash the subpoena on the grounds that there is a common law protectable interest in uh, Judy Miller being able to protect her confidential sources, that this was an effort to unmask those sources, and that therefore they should have standing to, to object to the subpoena that was issued not to Judy Miller but to the phone company. And there's a lot of interesting legal issues in, in this case, but the one I just wanted to highlight tonight um, was how the court handled the claim of, of, is there a privilege here? And again, it was a little bit uh, like a reprise of what happened in the, the D.C. Circuit. Two of the judges said, like Judge Henderson in D.C., we don't know if we're ready to um, formally say that there is a common law privilege, but assuming that there is one in this case, the prosecutor has made his, his, uh, met his burden, so we're not going to quash the subpoena. Um, Judge Sack, uh, up here in New York, who also teaches over at the law school, um, wrote a dissent. Um, uh, but what was important about Judge Sack's dissent was he kind of uh, outlined what I think is a roadmap through this, and we'll come back to in, in the final part of this talk. Um, what he said is, you know, what we're really fighting about here when we're talking about a common law privilege is whether there is any role for the courts to play in this fight over the protection of sources uh, and the flow of news. He said, if we don't recognize, if we as courts don't recognize a common law privilege, right, then the only person who's going to decide whether a reporter can be subpoenaed and whether a reporter can be forced to disclose their, their, their sources is the prosecutor. Because then there is no way for the journalist to come to court and say, this, this is wrong. 
there's an important constitutional issue here. We'll never get to title balancing and the weighing by judges of the constitutional considerations involved if we don't recognize a privilege. So what he said is, the dispute here isn't about special protections for the press. The dispute is about the balance of power. And what he says is a failure to recognize a common law reporter's privilege is essentially ceding to the executive branch a power that in our system should belong to the judges. That that's what we do when there are these competing claims of a constitutional interest in reporters getting information and a constitutional interest in the protection of, or the implementation of our criminal laws, a judge should be a part of that, that um, process. So, so that's, that's the law. I'm not going to talk about any more cases. You can all breathe a sigh of relief. But I'm going to talk about one more thing that happened um, recently that, that affects us, and that's the DOJ guidelines. What I said was for, for about 40 years, the Attorney General guidelines were probably the most significant protection that reporters had in the federal courts because they were so strict and because they required the Attorney General sign off. Well, you may all remember um, a year ago, um, it, was, it was disclosed that the Department of Justice had subpoenaed uh, the phone records of the AP in connection with a leak investigation. Uh, and unlike the Judy Miller case, and maybe because of the Judy Miller case, which tied them up for two years, and and uh, uh, you know, put the uh, the prosecution, the investigation off tracks. They didn't tell the AP they were going to subpoena its phone records, right? And there was a huge uproar um, because this was viewed as a real abuse um, by the Holder Justice Department. Um, and as that was all brewing back in May or June of last year, um, it was disclosed that a year earlier or a year and a half earlier. The Justice Department had also gotten a court to issue a search warrant to get the emails of a Fox News reporter. Well, this really uh, created concerns um, because to get that search warrant, and, and I'm, I'm, I promise I'm not going to go through this, but there's something called the Privacy Protection Act, which was passed by Congress many years ago after the police in, in uh, uh, Palo Alto or Oakland, California. Um, got a search warrant to go through the, the offices of the Stanford Daily Newspaper to get photographs of a, of a melee that they wanted to prosecute people. And Congress was so outraged by the use of a search warrant, and, and the reason a search warrant is important is different from a subpoena, is you can, uh, a prosecutor can get a search warrant by going to court and showing probable cause, and then they show up to search. You don't get advance notice, and that's the whole point of it, is that they want to catch you by surprise. With the subpoena, if they want you to turn over stuff, you get notice of it, and you can go to court and move to quash it. So what you had here was the AP case where a subpoena was issued uh, uh, to a phone company, a third-party phone company, without giving notice to the principals involved, the AP, and the Department of Justice getting a search warrant. And the only way under the Privacy Protection Act they could get a search warrant was by signing an affidavit saying they had probable cause to believe that the reporter himself was committing a crime, because that's what the... Congress did after this, answer, uh, this event at Stanford is they said, no, 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 we don't want prosecutors running through newspaper offices. You can only do that if the reporter himself or herself is the target of your criminal investigation. So they filled out an affidavit laying out all the facts they had about a, a State Department consultant um, who was being wooed by a Fox reporter essentially to give information, you know, saying, look, if you know what's going on about North Korea, I would like to know, I want to beat the competition, but just doing the sorts of things that reporters do. And on the basis of that, they went to court and said, we want to get his email from Yahoo or, or Google um, because we believe on these facts he has violated the Espionage Act. He's aiding and abetting a violation of the Espionage Act. Well, no reporter has ever been prosecuted for violating the Espionage Act, and that was really a stunning thing. So in the spring of 2013, there was this big uproar People were very upset. Uh, President Obama instructed uh, his attorney general, Eric Holder, to review the attorney general guidelines to see how things had gone wrong and to report back to him in a month, basically. I held him to a very tight spring in July. Um, and the attorney general reported back and said, look, we're going to fix this problem. He made all sorts of great sounding noises, like saying things like, no journalist will go to jail while I'm attorney general for doing the job of journalism, whatever that means. 
um, and promised to, to correct uh, what he viewed as gaps in the Attorney General guidelines, and also promised that he would come up with tough new rules um, about uh, who would get access to reporters' information when, in fact, it was subpoenaed to try to prevent this concern about misuse and abuse. Well, what happened is when the, when the new regulations finally came out, there were a number of good changes. Um, uh, he did say things like um, there, that, um, sorry, that there will be a presumption that notice will be given when a third party records are sought specifically to unmask a source. In other words, he was addressing the problem with AP. He said, well, you know what, from now on, if we're gonna do this, we'll give you notice. So he was addressing that problem. He also said, basically, we, <clears throat> we're not gonna issue search warrants uh, for reporters' materials if we don't intend to prosecute the reporter. And what they said is, look, we never intended to go after the Fox reporter. We just had to say that to get the search warrant. So he said, we won't do that anymore. And those were in the new regs when they came out. Um, and the other good thing he did was, you know, he expanded the regs, which were written back in the 70s and really only dealt with um, uh, telephone records and telephone communications and then were, were added uh, uh, some certain other documents later. But he, he, he brought it into all modern forms of communication. So now as they're written, it would include email and presumably social media and other things that if, if they want anything from a reporter, the regulations will apply. So those were all good things. Those were improvements. On the bad side, the new regulations, and this was the first time they were, they were amended in any material way in 40 years, right? The new regulations change the introductory language. Well, you may say, well, how important is that? Well, the ones that were written back in the 70s had all this very, um, uh, I would say flowery, but that, that doesn't put it quite right, very important language about the value of news gathering and the need for prosecutors not to interfere with reporters, right? The new regulations, when they came out, essentially said, uh, well, here, I have the actual language. The old policy was things like a reporter's responsibility, responsibility, a reporter's responsibility to cover as broadly as possible controversial public issues and seek to avoid legal process uh, is important. And the uh, Department of Justice must seek to avoid legal process, quote, that might impair the news gathering function. Well, that's a pretty strong statement if you're telling all the troops out in the, in the field News gathering is important. Reporters have a responsibility and we shouldn't interfere with it. Well, the new regs that came out last year say essentially, uh, a prosecutor who might need evidence from a reporter should balance the needs of national security, public safety, effective law enforcement, and the role of a free press. So now it's not like this nice language of, this is something we really need to think about. It's like, well, it's one of the things you should think about. Uh, among many things you're going to be thinking about as a prosecutor. And instead of the language saying we should not act to impair the news gathering function, it says we should not unreasonably impair ordinary news gathering. Well, I'm not quite sure what those mean. I think a lot of it is driven by the intelligence community and the desire to, um, to, uh, to, to reserve the possibility that the types of things that, that the Fox reporter was doing might not be considered ordinary news gathering if they're getting classified information. That's just a guess. But the other important thing was that when the regs came out, it included nothing of the promised restrictions on how this information could be stored, who would have access to it, how long it would be kept, things that they said they would do so that this information wasn't kept around later. Um, it's just gone and again, my suspicion would be that the intelligence community says, look at Department of Justice, if you get information, we want to see it. And so it disappeared from the regulations. In any event, <clears throat> I'll be quick now because I've just about used up my full hour. But we're at a point where things are really kind of tattered. We have these, these new Department of Justice regulations that hopefully as they're implemented will not seriously diminish or will not lead to more subpoenas. But we have this absolutely terrible um, Fourth Circuit opinion, which if it becomes widely accepted, says there is no common law privilege and there is no constitutional privilege. How do we, how do we move forward? A couple of things quickly, and we can talk about this more on questions if you want, but one is we need to, to um, make concrete, to quantify in a way that judges will understand when we have to litigate these things in the future, why the reporter's privilege is important. And part of that is your responsibility as journalists writing the kind of stories that will show that. I heard a, a, a journalism professor last spring say, you know, we've really, as journalists, we've dropped the ball 
in this area. For example, WikiLeaks. Everybody says this WikiLeaks thing was a terrible thing. Why aren't we writing stories about the number of dissidents in countries ruled by you know, horrible rulers who are now able to point to information in the WikiLeaks files when their government is lying to them? and the empowerment that the fact of the WikiLeaks disclosures has had. Those types of stories. But what I'm saying is we really need to be able to, to um, explain to judges why this is an important issue. <clears throat> Number two, I think as lawyers, the, the, your lawyers, when, when they're defending you and trying to fight these subpoenas, we need to draw upon other areas of the law, like the protection of anonymous speech. right? The most conservative justices on the Supreme Court, Justice Thomas and others, have written opinion after opinion about the, important, the political importance of anonymous speech in a number of contexts. You know, they go back to the posters during the Revolutionary War who would, who would write things anonymously and post them around town. They understand that the ability to speak anonymously, an individual's ability to speak anonymously, deserves First Amendment protection. And courts around the country have pretty uniformly said that when someone wants to find out who an anonymous speaker is on, you know, on, on a, a Twitter or Facebook or any type of social media, if, if they claim that they're being defamed and they want to know who that is, that name's not going to be given out automatically. There's a standard that has to be met, and it varies at different places. But they recognize that there is some need to protect the anonymous speaker, and therefore we're going to impose some burden before we're going to unmask that anonymous speaker. Well, the question that that I would ask is, why is it more important to protect someone who's anonymously posting to the internet, than it is, where, where whatever they're saying can't be checked, than it is to protect someone who anonymously is speaking to James Risen, who's going to vet it before he puts it out there and makes it public. It just doesn't make sense. So we need to, we need to think about that. Maybe we need to, to couch this right as a different type of right. You know, maybe we shouldn't be talking about it as a reporter's privilege but as an anonymous source privilege or a confidential source privilege um, might help uh, moving forward. Um, the third thing is, and again, this is more a legal thing, but we really need to correct the serious misreading of uh, the Powell opinion in Brandsburg that I think Judge Posner uh, uh, has pushed uh, and that others have. Certainly the Fourth Circuit got it completely wrong in saying that, that it was completely rejected, and, and we could talk a little bit about that. Um, but the final thing, is that I think in terms of litigating this and, and pulling the courts back from where the Fourth Circuit has gone, that Judge Tatel and Judge Sack have really shown the way. What we need to do is be talking to courts about the value of this, that there is a constitutional interest, and then explaining to them that a failure to recognize the privilege is essentially writing them out of the constitutional role here. And I think that's an argument that even uh, judges who, who bristle at the idea of special rights for reporters uh, might be willing to accept. So I didn't get to the role of technology and who's a journalist, but, but my hour is up. So I'm going to stop there, and we'll see where the questions are. So. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks very much indeed, David. As a, as, a law, um, as a law graduate, I can tell you that there's nothing like hearing all of those cases that you have to really put in context uh, to make you understand them better. Questions? Um, we have two microphones, one here, one there. Can I start off with a question which is, what about the role of technology? I'll steal that one from you right now, which is, uh, what, what, how does this change? We have our source protectors at the front here who've been working with um, journalists on how we keep our sources secure digitally. What's the, uh, what, what's the legal position? Well, the, the, you know, the, the technology in, in terms of this area, it kind of cuts both ways. You know, on the one hand, the technology and the ability to disseminate vast amounts of information, as shown in WikiLeaks, uh, makes it much more important from the government's perspective to prevent leaks. And so you have this much greater impulse and much greater uh, vigor in uh, stemming leaks because of technology. But on the other side, um, there may well be technological solutions. I think certainly Pierre Omidyar and, and uh, other people who are looking at these things think at the end of the day, um, you know, my role is not going to be important in terms of trying to convince the court that there's a privilege, that there are going to be technologies developed so that reporters can, with some level of confidence, talk, um, uh, communicate with their sources without fear that the government will be able to, to get that. And that may happen. Uh, I don't know how that plays out. You know, the, the fact is that this is another fallout from Snowden, uh, 
that people now think about their privacy. They think about privacy from the government in ways they didn't before. As just this, you know, last week, the whole effort by Apple to, to market the, the iPhone 6 uh, in part because of this uh, encryption technology that, that even the government won't be able to, uh, to crack uh, if they get a court order. And you, I don't know if you saw the, the pushback from uh, uh, the head of the FBI, Mr. Comey, this week, you know, sort of saying, you know, how dare people want to put themselves above the law? We, we can have a talk about whether that's really putting yourself above the law. But I think that it is likely that there will be technologies developed and that there will be technological solutions to this issue of how do people communicate in a confidential way. But I think we need the legal piece of it. So. Hi. Given that um, with evolving technology, the definition of journalist is radically different than it was back in the 70s, does that make your job easier or harder in terms of protecting the free press? Well, I don't know if it may, it, it, it creates a new issue. You know, it, it, um, a few years ago, there was a reporter at the um, New Republic who wrote a book, I'm forgetting his name right now, uh, called We're All Journalists Now. And he basically said, this is a good thing, and the First Amendment should be recognized as an individual right, not an institutional right. Um, it creates a, a new issue in the sense of um, if there is going to be a privilege recognized, whether it's common law or constitutional, question is who's entitled to invoke it. Um, a number of courts have looked at that. It's not a new issue. They're going back to the um, 1980s, I think. Does anybody remember? This is really a history quiz for all you. Klaus von Bülow, does that ring a name at all? What? Klaus von Bülow? Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. So this was another really celebrated case, right? Klaus von Bülow was a big socialite, very wealthy. His wife was very wealthy. He married into the wealth. Um, he was accused, his wife ended up in a coma uh, for many years. He was accused by his stepchildren, the, the children of his wife, of basically trying to kill their mother uh, and having in, put her into this state where she was in this like permanent vegetative state by giving her excess injections of insulin. She was diabetic. And there was a whole trial. And there was a criminal prosecution of Klaus von Bülow for trying to, to kill his mother. Anyway, it ends up as a reporter's privilege issue uh, because um, one of Klaus's uh, confidants, an, an intimate friend as she was described, and someone who sat through the criminal trial every day, um, taking copious notes and having talked with Klaus about various things, was subpoenaed in the civil case where the children were suing their father. Right? And she says, reporter's privilege. You, and, and in the Second Circuit, there is a recognized reporter's privilege in civil litigation. You're going to have to show you can't get this elsewhere and you know, the whole test. And the Second Circuit said, well, you know, this raises a real interesting question of who's a journalist. And what she claimed is all these notes she was taking were for purposes of writing a book and that she really was uh, a journalist. And the Second Circuit rejected that claim, but they lay down a definition of who could, who could um, claim the privilege that essentially says to claim it, uh, you have to have an intent to gather information for the purpose of disseminating it at the time that you do it. And essentially, you have to have some track record that, that you've, you've done that. Um, and Congress, which is considering a, a shield law that would cut through all, everything I've just said, you know, if they pass a law, that would, then that would solve the common law issue. Um, in, the, in the various versions of the bill that are in front of Congress now, they take a similar approach. They, they say, we're going to define the people who can claim this type of a privilege functionally. We're not going to try to you know, put labels on people, but it's what they do that the privilege is intended to protect a certain function, which is gathering news for the purposes of dissemination. They have to, to claim it, someone would have to have, um, the information that was the subject of the subpoena would have to have been gathered in that context. So even if you're a reporter for the AP and you, you, know, you uh, witness a robbery on your way to work, but it wasn't part of your job, you probably aren't gonna be able to claim the privilege. Um, and you have to have some track record. It has to have been a regular part of your work for some period of time. So, so there's a definitional issue, but I think there are ways to deal with it that still would give meaning to meaningful protection to the people who need it. Does that hold up today, though? Like, any person who witnesses a robbery can take a picture with their cell phone and kind of claim that they're a journalist if they publish that, or some. I guess I'm kind of wondering in terms of Twitter and people just becoming impromptu journalists. Maybe they haven't had formal training or worked for a newspaper before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and, and that's exactly what I mean. Congress is dealing with, and I think the definition that 
that the Senate has adopted would say no, you know, and unless you have some track record, and they're still tinkering with the language. At one point, there was language in the bill that said you had to have actually been paid as a journalist for some period of time or had been affiliated with a, a media organization, which had, they were really trying to get rid of bloggers. But, but the key to it is, what is your intent at the time? And do you have some track record? If you've never published anything, you don't run a blog every day, you don't, and you happen to see something and snap it with your phone and say, well, I was going to go sell it to the AP, it's probably not going to fly. Uh, when I was, like, somewhat, somewhat related question, do you think can, that the can you right, lift the mic? Yeah. Do you think that the right, the, the you know, they've proposed media shield laws in Congress, do you think that right should be extended to bloggers, who, uh, particularly those who have sharp opinions over they be left or right? Do you think that shield privilege should be granted to them as well, in addition to regular news gathering organizations? No, well, I think I think the shield law should apply to anybody who's who is engaged in the activity of journalism, which is who, who is out there seeking actively seeking information for the purposes of disseminating it to the public. That, that that's the reason the the reason that that we fight for a privilege, and the arguments in favor of it, the policy arguments say that that we need the privilege to promote the flow of information to the public. So the people who anyone should be able to claim it if that's what they are doing and what what the the bill that in congress has been grappling with is how do we define the people who are entitled to do that it's, it's got to be someone who's doing it on a regular basis and and um you know not just someone who is asserting an objection to try to help a friend avoid a you know a criminal rap so time for wine questions it's time it's <laughs> time for i just i just want to sorry I'm addicted to asking questions. Um, just one last question, which is, so y you deal with a range of media organizations and uses. Would you say that things are, are getting, you, you haven't answered your own question, which is, is the Obama administration worse than Nixon? I've, I've heard people from, from that era going, there's no way he's worse than Nixon, and others saying this is as bad as it's been. Yeah. Um, I'm not one of those who would necessarily adopt that view, but I understand why people do. I mean, the, the problem is what prompted that, and Jim Goodale, again, the name I mentioned earlier, was one of the people out there saying, you know, this is worse than it ever was under Nixon. He started that notion. And what he was saying is, in reaction to the AP subpoena, the certain, you know, Nixon never um, secretly subpoenaed records in, in that way. He never um, accused reporters of espionage uh, and various other things. And, you know, and I think that really stings because the Obama administration, particularly Attorney General Holder, does not want that to be his legacy and doesn't see him as particularly anti-press. He had a series of um, communications or uh, meetings with representatives of the media as he was developing these regulations and he would bring everybody into this conference room with the Department of Justice, sit them around the table and say, you know, this is where Bobby Kennedy's kids played and you see those those holes on the wall, that's where they, you know, they, they shot at the wall and with their arrows or whatever. And, you know, I believe in the traditions of Bobby Kennedy. And he really, it really, I think, um, affected him personally. On the other hand, the Obama administration has been extraordinarily aggressive in going after leakers. Um, they have now, I think, indicted nine, nine people or pursued nine leak, uh, criminal leak investigations. There have only been six or seven in all the prior years, back to 1917, when the, when the Espionage Act was first adopted. And you could say part of that is we're in, in a war on terror now. Part of it is the new technologies that make it easier to find leakers. I mean, that's the other whole thing, you know, that at the end of the day, a reporter's privilege, I should have mentioned this, uh, the, the other problem with technology, a reporter's privilege may become irrelevant if the, if the government has the technology to figure out where the information came from without even going to the reporter, which is what happened in the AP case where they went to the phone company and got the records. Uh, and I think there's more of that. So does the Obama administration view the press as an enemy? No. Do they, you know, are they out to, uh, to um, uh, undermine the press directly? I don't think so at all. And I think Nixon was. So I, I think they're a long way from being worse than Nixon on many scores. So. Well, that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a, oh, hang on, there is, a, sorry, there is, there is one, there's one question. There's always one, I find. You know, you're standing between all of us and that wine, between, so it's better be good. And, and the wine. <laughs> it's all right, Smith, she's, it'll be a good question.
Um, so I have a question. You um, you alluded a bit to this in your example. Of I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Sorry. So um, you alluded a bit to this in your example of WikiLeaks and the fact that sort of the value of WikiLeaks to sort of the rest of the world hasn't really been highlighted in our media. How do you? What are sort of your opinions about international reporting and how it's changed in the past decade and whether it's been affected by sort of all of these legal questions as well? I, I miss the end. My concern is about national international reporting, and international. you alluded a bit to this in the in sort of your reference of WikiLeaks and the the lack of reporting in the American media of sort of the value of a lot of the leaks to people in countries where they didn't have access to information. Yeah. Do you feel yeah. like international reporting has sort of stayed on course or, or been not as strong in the past decade with sort of all these challenges and the war on terror, et cetera? You know, I'm not sure I have a good view on that. I mean, the, the comments I was passing on were from a, a, a professor, um, and I was just trying to underscore the point that there's a role for journalists here, too, in, in helping us establish the, the importance of the privilege. Um, and I don't know that I have a good answer to whether international reporting is better or worse or how it's been affected specifically. We can talk a lot about the differences, you know, the Guardian's, uh, you know, the experience of the Guardian in London versus the experience of the Guardian here and why the First Amendment really is a very important um, protection that we have in this country, but that's probably another talk, so. That is another talk, and now it is um, time for wine. Before we let you have wine, Jen <laughs> Henriksen is going to say just one thing about our next event, and then there is, uh, I've heard it being uncorked, there is alcohol at the back. But first of all, I also want to thank David very much indeed. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'll keep this brief because of the refreshments in the back. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know that we do have several more lectures this fall coming up. And the first lecture after this one, of course, is on October 21st, and it will be at Yale Law School and at the Information Society Project. And we will be having Dean uh, Steve Cole presenting on investigative journalism and source protection. And then the next lecture is on November 18th. And that will be here at Columbia, and we will be featuring Ethan Zuckerman, who is the director of the Center for Civic Media at MIT. And then we'll conclude the series on December 2nd at Yale with Jill Abramson, former New York Times executive editor and Harvard lecturer. So just to give you a sense, and if you picked up a form at the front desk, all this information is there, so it's readily available, and we'll be tweeting about it and Facebooking about it, et cetera, so just keep yourself posted. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you to this great audience. We filled the whole room, which is fantastic. We went to overflow. Um, thank you so much to the Tao Foundation and the Knight Foundation for funding Journalism After Snowden, as well as thank you to the Brown Institute for Media Innovation for letting us be in this fabulous space tonight. And a big thank you to Liz, who um, is our administrator at the Tao Center, whose help was instrumental in getting this event off the ground and ready for you guys. Um, and with that, one more thank you to the Yale Information Society Project, who is our partner with the lecture series. So thank you, thank David, um, and let's give him another round of applause.